Ali, this is Ali, and this is Ali's roadmap to success. I'm sitting on the beach, buddy. Yes, you're gonna climb on top of me. Climbing on top of a human could be a way of claiming them. So I didn't invite him up, so I'm not gonna pet him for this. I'd like him to be in the shot, at least initially, so we can have a screen grab for YouTube uh, of Ali with me. But um, if he come, jumps up on you and you pet him, you're kind of saying, yes, it's okay for you to claim me. So there's nothing wrong with him being on your lap when you invite him. But if he does it on his own, it can be ownership and claiming. So there's a distinction between the two of those. Um, yes, you're selling uh, all the other puppies on my shoe. Sit. All right, so uh, this is passive training right here. So he sat down on his own. I'm petting him within three seconds of doing it and saying the word sit and only the word sit. Not good sit, not Ollie sit, not oh, what a smart dog you sat down. Because that's a different word. So just don't conjugate, just say the command word. So passive training is just waiting for the dog to organically offer you the behavior that you want and within three seconds rewarding him and marking it by saying the new command word. So I like using fun command words, calling this beach. Uh, he really likes this dog bed and we might come back and show, do the relaxation protocol and teach him to sit here and be calm for longer and longer periods of time. Uh, but uh, the first way to do it, just throw a treat here. When he has one or more paws on it and he licks it up, you would say the word beach. Um, I do this with usually about 10 treats around. Now he already likes this because he doesn't really use the furniture, but this is a great way to assign the command word for it. And then every time he goes here on his own, you should say the word beach if you don't have any treats. If you have a treat, you can throw the treat, but you don't have to do it every single time. But after a while, going here, I always hear the word beach, so that becomes the command word for this. Passive training, uh, that would be an example of passive training. He comes over here on his own and you just say the word beach. Every time he eats his food, come up with a fun word that means to eat. So sushi, chimichanga, filet mignon, whatever you want to say. So every time he takes his first bite for four months, you say the word chimichanga. After I say chimichanga, he'll run to go eat, eat his food. And we're going to talk about how we can feed you here in a minute. Um, okay, so that's passive training. Uh, the Guardian's watched a lot of my videos, so I, I kind of bypass a lot of stuff I normally go in my session. One of the things I, I'm big on is petting with a purpose. The Guardian's already doing that. But make sure you use the watchword of paycheck. Um, I usually say, uh, now I say uh, celebrate for passive training. Um, and I say for petting with a purpose, I usually say paycheck. So if I say paycheck, that means I suspect someone might be petting without a purpose. I just want to keep you in the shot for a little bit more and then I'll let you go, I promise. Um, so uh, if the dog comes up to me and I, and I miss it, or, or let me see, I'm petting the Ollie when he's standing and so I come to the room, they might suspect that I forgot to pet with a the purpose. They say, paycheck, I stop petting. I say, sit. And if Ollie sits within three seconds, I pet him and say, sit. And if he doesn't pet, sit within three seconds, I show him I got other things to do. I pull up my phone, uh, I watch TV, I read a magazine or newspaper or whatever it is, and show the dog I got other things to do. I made you number one, but if he can't be bothered to sit, I got other things to do. So a pet, petting with a purpose is if you want to pet him or he wants, he's nudging you or jumping up on you, you give him a counter order to sit or lay down. Don't do the, I would never recommend uh, practicing the shake, especially because they have a little one. It's one of the first things people teach the dog and it causes probably a lot of problems. It causes a lot of problems. So basically, um, uh, petting with a purpose and passive training are all basically adding a little bit of structure. Leaders tell, followers ask. So if I tell him what to do, or excuse me, if he tells me what to do, down, passive training. So if he comes up and jumps up on me and nudges me, he's telling me what to do. If I follow through and pet him, then that tells him he's the boss of me. So for passive training, we're just waiting for him to do it and just saying, this is a great way to get my attention. Remember, many, many people train their dogs to misbehave because we yell at them or correct them when they do the wrong things. And for dog, good attention, bad attention, pretty much the same thing. So if he comes to me and I ignore it and he chews the carpet and I correct him, well, then he's going to go back to chewing the carpet because that's what gets him his attention. So uh, the more that we use passive training, the more the dog will do the things that we want him to do. Um, all right, we also talked about uh, uh, rules and exercise. Uh, I'll start with exercise. He gets a walk and his dog, guardian's done a great job with him on walking, but he has problems. There's some things that he doesn't like on the walks. So remember when you're on a walk, if there's something, <laughs> yeah, I'll talk about maintenance here in a second. But if you're on a walk and there's something that he's reactive to, take note of it. Is it maybe a lawnmower or a leaf blower or a hammering or whatever it is? If you can, pull out your phone, not while him barking at it. But if you can get a clean recording of it and then you can come in and do what the, I showed you above in the counter conditioning video and desensitize him and actually make him like that sound as opposed to running away or cowering when he hears it. Um, so we also talked about, uh, at least you can use the stairs. Uh, we can use a laser. He liked the laser. Usually he's fearful of the laser, but the laser sometimes taps into the prey drive. So if he gets anxious or whiny, stop doing the laser. That's really just, I use that as really a, a stopgap measure for other things. Scent is a big one and earning his food, we can combine those two. So uh, scent games, something you just go, go to Google and just Google scent games, it's like hiding treats around the house. 
So then he's got to use his nose to find them. That's very draining. Like I mentioned on walks, make sure you let him sniff as much as you want. Instead of think, going around, I'm going to walk four blocks and get back to the house. I'm going to walk down this direction for 10 minutes. Then when I, my timer hits, I cross the street and walk back for another 10 minutes if I'm taking a 20 minute walk. So we're gonna let him sniff and do what he wants to do within reason. Sniffing is very physically draining for dogs. It is also satisfying and calming. And since he has problems being outside on walks, the more these sniffs, the calmer he should become. Uh, but if he's really anxious and worked up because there's a contraction site, don't try to walk around or away from those sort of things, at least initially. Uh, but again, we prefer to capture the sound and help him uh, get over the sensation of it by using that desensitization technique. Um, okay, so um, for exercise, he probably needs more exercise he's getting now. Also, exercising him before things happen can really set him up for success. So if you're going to have uh, somebody come, you know, if you're having some family members come over, I would take him out for a long walk, maybe a 20 you know, minute walk each way, come back, give him like five minutes, 10 minutes to recover. Then uh, I would, you know, before they come, before, when, tell them, ask them to text you when they're on their way here. So they text you, you got 15 minutes. Take him the stairs, throw those treats up and down the stairs for another five minutes. He needs to have at least 10 minutes to recover before they come in the door. But now if you really deplete his energy, instead of jump, bouncing around the baby or jumping up with people, he has a little bit less energy to deal with and it's easier to manage. Now, um, uh, you can use the technique, the leash technique that, I sh that you've watched in one of my videos, but you really need to rep and practice that. And practicing when, you're in, uh, when your actual family members come over, not ideal. We try to teach dogs in the moment, and it's the worst time to teach anything. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to make a list of all the things that he uh, doesn't, you know, that he misbehaves on. I'm going to talk about baby here, but there's other things as well. So instead of actually having a baby uh, come over that he likes to lick and jump up on and follows around and barks at and all the rest of that fun stuff, he's practicing all the things we don't want. So what we want to do is first teach him to be calm. So we might set up an X pen, uh, just X pen. You can get them on, those on Amazon. There are eight panels. He probably only needs one, maybe 32 inches high. And you maybe set it up in here so he can have it going here, going behind the couch and going out in the room a little bit and then going here. So he has a little bit of an area. But when we have the grandchild here, the grandchild has the whole house he can run around in. He can't get to them. Now, if he's all worked up, that means we didn't set him up for success. So the first thing I would do is set up the X-Pen, and I would have him practice going in there and chewing on a bully stick without any kid here, without any, any stimulus, no reason to be ex excited. We want to practice being in this area, confined, and, and having something good happen, and practice being calm. Once we get to the point, and I would maybe do that maybe twice a day with a bully stick, bully bite, um, for maybe a week. And after a week, then I would find a friend who has a child who's around the same age. Then I would have him over there. Well, actually, before that, uh, I would even do a stop camera. Have your friend come over without the child the first time. Put him in there. You guys just sit on the couch and chat a little bit. And a short visit is fine. He gets a bully stick. He hangs out. So now he's practicing being calm when that woman's here. Then she leaves. Next time she comes in, she has a baby. So we put him in here. He has a bully stick. The baby is here about the same age doing the same things. But now we've helped him practice being calm in there. We've provided him distractors while he's been in there. And he's gotten used to the woman being here. Now we've had the kid. And he should kind of continue doing what he's doing because we've set him up for success. Remember, what we want to do if a dog fails is we want to recreate that situation. Break it down and, uh, first of all, create the easiest version of that situation. Then we break it down into individual steps. And sometimes steps of steps. So in this case, we get him first used to just being in the dependent area while something good happens. Then been in the pendant area for multiple days. Well, not in a row, but uh, so enough repetition. Then we have the guest come over and he stays in there. He doesn't get to interact with her. That's good practice as well. And then eventually when we have the baby come over, he's done all the steps. He knows what to do. And after you've had the baby come over, he's been nice and relaxed there for a while. You could actually start doing this where you open the, the doorway. Make sure the x pen that you get has a doorway. Don't ever lift him over it. Make him always go through it. Otherwise, it teaches them to climb over it. So then what I would do is I would have the woman come over again and now have the door open to the X-Pen, but he's in the X-Pen, he has a bully stick. So you can use the same principle I showed you over there, walking towards him and back, to teach him, just because the door's open, he doesn't mean he can come out. So now he practices with the baby here, crawling around, and he's in here, but he can't pass the threshold because we've taught him how to behave. And so he practices that, practices that, practices that, and by the time you actually have uh, your family members come over, we've taught him how to behave, we've helped him practice how to behave, and we've created an analog of it, a scrimmage, if you will. And then when the baby comes over, now it's gonna be a little bit harder for the baby because he's used to jumping up and licking and doing all the rest of this stuff. So we set him up for success by giving him that exercise. And so by the time we actually uh, have the baby come over, he should behave a lot better. Um, now, um, 
let me see, the more that you practice having him not go in the kitchen, I know he doesn't like going in the kitchen, but in the dining room area, try to eat a snack out here and create a boundary. Like maybe there's a line that goes from the edge of this couch to the middle of this cushion, this square, he's not allowed to go in when you have a snack. You're his primary person. So it's gonna be really hard for him not to go in there. But if he just has to stay right outside and there's an invisible line and nothing blocking him, that's him practicing some self-restraint. And again, he needs to practice being a part of you. Separation anxiety is kind of one of his issues. We didn't really work on this. Uh, but really the way you do that is by helping the dog practice being slightly apart from you. you. Go to the bathroom and he stays outside the bathroom door with the door closed. Eventually it'd be nice if you go in the bathroom and leave the door open. That usually sounds weird, but uh, there's just you and your partner in the house. So basically, we I may, and you would simulate that. So you go in, uh, as soon as you cross into the bathroom, turn to face him at the doorway. And then take a step backwards the same way I showed you there until you're all the way back in the toilet. Put the toilet seat down and sit down on it. Don't actually pull your pants down and all the rest of that stuff. Just sit down on it. And as soon as you sit down, he's going to probably come in. So as he does, you, that's why you don't have your pants down. So you rush towards him, and as soon as he vacates and crosses the line, you stop. Then take a step backwards, pause, step backwards, pause, but make sure your hips are pointed. Don't have your back to him because he'll run right up. And eventually then you go in there and you're practicing going there and then flush the toilet while you're sitting on there and you're not doing the business, you're simulating it. And eventually you go in there and you tell, and then you go across the threshold, you go sit down, you do your business and he stays outside and he's practicing being apart from you. Um, also, if you've taught him a stay, I like using the stay in real world situations. So if you're going to get a drink of water, he's sitting right next to you, stand up, say, sit, stay. Then you go get a drink of water, fill up your glass, come back, and then give him his release cue. So now he practiced staying while you spent 60 seconds walking there and back. He knows you're not leaving, but it's again, not, it's somewhere between that zero and 100. So the more that we can help him practice a little self-control, we'll boost some confidence in him. And he, a dog's <laughs> Like this, a lot of times, where, uh, it's more of a lack of confidence. Now, if I yell when he's doing this, that's rewarding him for barking. But what I can do is I've got a treat. Now, this isn't ideal because this can be rewarding him, but I want to have the sound of this hitting. So, I distracted him away from it. He walked and went to find out what it was, and he got a treat. Now, don't give your dog a treat for barking. That'll teach them to bark. But he's at the, he's barking. There's a sliding door leading in the backyard, and he likes to bark. There was like a praying mantis that was on the, on the screen, and he freaked out seeing that there. It was a pretty big one. Uh, but basically, it's a uh, dog's eyes get them in trouble. So I'd like the guardian to practice a little maintenance. She's got all, this, all these great windows and these great views, and she can't enjoy any of them because there's, every blind is down. So we want to do a Roman blind or basically just cover the bottom part of these windows. So you can go to... Kinko's or Office Max, get a big, they have a big roll, it's three feet tall and then as wide and as long as you want to make it printed. So you can get it and cut it exactly so it fits the bottom, like maybe third of your windows. You can leave your blinds open. We can get all this nice light to come in and he goes to the window to bark at the squirrel. Well, he doesn't get the visual verification or the validation that his barking made them go away. After about three or four months, he'll get out of a habit of going there when he hears sounds to go and bark at things because if he goes there, he can't see what it is anyways. So I do it for these three windows, your, both of your sliding glass doors, because he's just going to nudge it and go to the other one. I'd also do it to your door in the front. Now, we're about to go into change of season, so you're probably not going to have your door open too long, too much, but same sort of principle. So he goes to the front door. He's in guard dog mode. Like I said earlier, he sits here, he faces there, he faces there. Well, we want to help him get the validation, because when he barks at something and then that thing eventually goes away, he thinks it's his barking that made it go away and that validates and rewards it and makes it happen more and more often. If he goes there and he can't bark or he barks, he doesn't see it go away, he doesn't get the validation. After a couple months, you could take that stuff down and then he's out of a habit of doing it. Um, we also talked about uh, rules. Uh, now he can't get on the furniture, so he doesn't get on the furniture except for he gets on the bed. I would recommend the guardians get like a steps or one of those uh, ramps so he could get on the bed on his own but don't let him on the bed until you give him an invitation. If he gets up in the bed, you kind of escort him to the edge. You can either push him so he feels like he's teeter tottering, he jumps down, or you just take a treat, throw it on the ground, and when he jumps down to get it off and licks it up, say the word uh, off. Um, so the idea is um, he starts seeing a literal distinction. Now, he already has it here, and having him in the bed with you guys when you watch TV and all that stuff is fine. Uh, but uh, right now, he's also kenneled. And uh, he doesn't really, he has a couple accents, a couple spots, but we've had those parts cordoned off. Everything else, he doesn't chew and do any of the rest of those things. So what I would do, hey buddy, there's a treat right there. I see you checking me out. 
is watching. Guard dog. He is on guard. I think this is why he has so much cortisol. He thinks he's on duty all the time. So he sleeps in the kennel, That's uh, and he doesn't get in trouble, so that would be the time where I'd want to help him practice being alone, uh, being uh, not kennel. So put him in the kennel and close the door, but don't latch it when you go to bed. And then when you, and try to make sure that you go around, there's nothing that temptation-wise, he's not a big chewer, but make sure there's nothing that he can get into. So now he'll, he'll eventually figure out his, he's out. He'll come out, it might take a couple days before he figures that out. He comes, he jumps up and looks, he sees you on the bed, goes on the other side, he hears him snoring. Okay, they're safe, I'm gonna do my patrol real quick. Maybe I'm gonna grab a toy. Remember, keep your uh, toy uh, basket down on the ground so you can get them at any time. Remember, you should have at least 30 toys, so or 20 toys. So get some, Am uh, so uh, go to Amazon or Chewy, get some antlers, uh, at least one water buffalo horn, a couple of vanilla bones of different shapes and flavors and uh, go to the green spot, get a couple marrow bones, have them chew those outside. Again, good practice in being outside. Uh, and then once the marrow is out, then you can have the bone and he can leave those in there. And he needs a number of things to chew. Also get him some antlers. Uh, okay, so um, let me see. Uh, before that, what was I talking about? Uh, exercise or uh, rules. So um, I should not be allowed in around the dinner table when we're eating. Shouldn't be allowed in the kitchen when we're preparing food. Right now that's not an issue for him. Has to sit before we let him in or out of the door. And, uh, and eventually you get to the point where if you, if you go message me later on, I can share a video where you can teach him how to stay with the door wide open until you give him permission or to go out. Uh, but all these things are great ways for him to practice some self-restraint and some self-control. The more he does that, the better equipped he's going to be to do it with the baby. Now, for the baby, uh, again, I would practice uh, the baby eats in a high chair over there. So what I would do is, again, like I showed you, um, go over the area where you're going to be, toss a treat there, and when it comes down, call reservations or whatever the word is you want to use. And then just and then have him do that about five treats, and then ask him to sit and give him the treat and say reservation. And just you do that a couple times when there's no baby and there's nothing out. And then the next time you, you come and uh, tell him to do a reservation, and have Dave or somebody bring the baby chair out and put it there. And so he's staying there while the baby chair goes in there. Um, so now he's practicing when one simulation, one element of that. And eventually uh, you get to the point where maybe uh, you guys are eating in the bar and he still is there for reservation. So he practices being calm and not invading your personal space while you're eating. Um, you can also create invisible lines or put that painter's tape down so he knows he's not on a cross line and practice it just the same way I showed you. Remember, recreate all these things as much as you can and help him practice each individual step in the easiest version possible, then work your way back to the real world situation. Um, other rules um, uh, for the door, tell him to sit one time. If he doesn't sit, walk away, sit down nearby, wait one minute, then, and ask Siri or Alexa or whoever you have for a one minute timer. Go back to the door and command him to sit. And they only command him one time. The more you say it, the less you mean it. So I say sit, if he doesn't sit, then I walk away and I sit down next time for two minutes. Next time I walk away and sit down for four minutes, eight minutes, and so on. Eventually when you go, you don't wanna go outside, he does. So you have leverage over him. What you're saying is if you want something from me, barking at me isn't gonna work. But sitting, oh, if I tell you to sit and you sit, that door flies open like it's light speed. After a while, he'll sit at the door as his way of saying, I wanna go outside. Remember, if you want to use the bells to teach him to go potty, I would just take the bell out with him, and as soon as he starts pee or pooping, ring it, and then clamp it or stop it ringing, pop a treat in his mouth, give him another one, and ring it while he's chewing it. So we associate that, and then hang the bell next to the door, not on the door. Um, I'm trying to think. Is there anything else we want to go over? I don't think so. I think that's about it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, uh, normally I'd say this is Ollie, but he's on patrol at the door. So uh, uh, this, is Oliver, uh, this is Ollie's roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it.